Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Martin Moeller, and I'm the museum's senior vice president and curator. Very glad to have you here with us tonight for this program. Uh, this is part of our Spotlight on Design lecture series, which has been going on now for more than 10 years, celebrating outstanding achievements and outstanding people in architecture, landscape architecture, and design. The next installment in this series, at risk of getting ahead of ourselves, but just so you know, is coming up in January with a lecture by Curtis Fentress. Uh, his Denver-based firm is known for a variety of very large-scale projects, uh, including, perhaps most notably, the uh, international airports at Denver, Colorado, and Seoul, Korea. I actually was just in Seoul last week on business and flew through uh, the Incheon Airport there that he designed, and I can tell you it is huge and also architecturally spectacular. So we're looking forward to that presentation in January. You can find additional information about uh, the lecture series and uh, other programs, of course, about the Building Museum, including videos and uh, tapes uh, of past lectures at our website, which is www.nbm.org. So please visit that if you have not already done so. This lecture series is made possible by two organizations which, with which the museum has had very long-standing relationships, and we're very grateful for that, uh, their relationships with us. Uh, Spotlight on Design is generously supported by Lafarge, the world leader in building materials, and additional support is provided by the American Institute of Architects. Representing these two organizations here tonight are two people whom we are also very proud to have as members of the museum's board of trustees. First, speaking on behalf of Lafarge will be Sylvain Garneau, president of cement for Lafarge North America. And he will come up directly, or coming up directly after him rather, will be Paul Welch, honorary AIA, who is the interim CEO of the American Institute of Architects. Sylvain. Thank you, Martin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Lafarge participates in uh, many national and inter international events with the objective of contributing to discussions on uh, architecture, and uh, on urbanism, and more and more on sustainable construction. And uh, we are very proud to have been the, the sponsor of those uh, spotli Spotlight on Design series since 2001. Together, through those evenings, we have welcomed thousands of guests and featured many acclaimed architects and of course, tonight, we are very proud to be able to welcome uh, uh, Cesar Pelli. And um, so we, we have this sponsorship with, the, with this partnership with the National Building Museum since many years, as I mentioned, since more than a decade now. And uh, for us, it's an important step, uh, an important part of our commitment to work closer with architects and with the construction industry in general. As, Lafar, as, as, Martin, as Martin mentioned it earlier, we are the world leader in building materials. Uh, and of course, we are proud about it. But uh, more importantly for us, uh, our goal is to collaborate with the, the world of architecture to, become, to make uh, buildings which are more innovative, uh, easier to live in. And uh, this is really what uh, we try to focus more and more, and that's part of it tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm very honored to welcome uh, Cesar Pelli, and I would like to thank the National Building Museum for all their work in, in support of uh, Spotlight on uh, Design, and thank you all, of course, for being here tonight. Good evening. Thank you for uh, being here this evening and uh, supporting the National Bu Building Museum and, and thank you to the Building Museum for hosting uh, the uh, Spotlight on Design lecture series. It is a pleasure uh, for me to be here this evening to emphasize the partnership between uh, the National Building Museum and the American Institute of Architects. Uh, we are pleased to sponsor this program which uh, promotes uh, the awareness of, of design and the architectural profession and its impact on the communities we serve uh, and the general public. Together, the AI and the National Building Museum uh, emphasize the importance of design in shaping our future through several uh, 
uh, strategic uh, programs during the year, uh, emphasizing new technologies and uh, combined with creativity and uh, the passion that we have uh, for design. The AIA and the National Building Museum have a long-standing relationship, and uh, we work hard to support uh, and influence in, uh, in the field of uh, uh, the built environment. Uh, design does matter in enhancing the human experience, and clearly uh, your being here tonight is supportive of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, creativity. So thank you again for supporting the program. of the series. Uh, tonight we have uh, some additional support that I want to uh, recognize. This program in particular is presented in collaboration with the Smithsonian Latino Center and as part of the series Argentina at the Smithsonian 2010. And we'd like to thank the center's director Eduardo Diaz and Ronald Wooderman for their collaboration on this program. Uh, now, uh, on to the uh, program for this evening. Uh, I, I, I tend not to favor very long introductions of uh, people, especially when uh, the lead speaker is one of the most famous architects on earth. Uh, it seems rather unnecessary. Uh, I will also be introducing a little bit later on uh, our second guest for the panel discussion uh, that will follow our main speaker's presentation. But I do want to say a few words about uh, Cesar Pelli, uh, that some things you may be uh, not so aware, aware of. Uh, he uh, is originally from Argentina. He studied at the University of Tucumán in Argentina before completing his studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and he worked uh, with Eero Saarinen, the uh, fabled architect during the heyday of, uh, of his practice, an extraordinary time, and went on to work with a variety of large firms before becoming dean of the School of Architecture at Yale and establishing his own firm, which was initially known as uh, Cesar Pelli and Associates. Uh, he has done an extraordinarily wide variety of work. And I would just like to add on a personal note, I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting him on a number of occasions. And despite the many very high profile clients uh, that uh, he works with and the uh, great prestige of his work, he's, I've just always found him to be a remarkably personable and uh, gracious person. And so we're very pleased to have him with us tonight. With that, please welcome Cesar Pelli. Hello, I, I am really delighted to be here. I do not know how good a piece of architecture this room is, but it lifts my spirits, and that's good enough. I think it's wonderful. I, I, I love to be in the building museum. I, I will talk with you about some very recent work in my, in my office, but I would just like to start by saying a few words that will give shape to what I have to say. You know, most architects know that there are some buildings that speak. A very few buildings sing. And very many are mute. And this really is perhaps one of the most important things to be concerned about when one designs any, 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 any building. We know that and we appreciate buildings that sing. That's why we spend great deals of money visiting cities like Paris or Venice is because those cities are full of architectural music. And they are extraordinary. And, and, and those qualities are gained building by building. So every building we do may contribute or detract to the total quality of a city. So I, I will talk a little in those terms to some buildings that I have, I have designed. First of all, here in Washington, D.C., it's Reagan National Terminal, the new terminal that we designed. I, I, I probably just vanity, but I think this is a building that sings. <laughs> At least it's, it sings to me and my friends. They, and uh, this, I, I couldn't be better represented here. It's a building that tells people you have arrived at a noble place the capital of the United States. And you don't need to say it with sign. You just feel it as soon as you arrive and walk in this concourse. You just sense a certain nobility in the place, a, a, a certain welcome quality that tells you you are here and you are welcome to be here. 
We, I'll show you some other recent work. We are at this moment designing another terminal, a very different kind of terminal in downtown San Francisco. This is the Trans Bay Terminal. It's a multimodal terminal. It will accommodate all commuter buses, seven or eight lines of buses that go all over around the Bay Area. It will accommodate commuter trains, and most importantly, it will also be the terminal of the new rapid rail system that California is building from San Diego to Sacramento. This will be the San Francisco terminal of the rapid rail. This was an international competition that we entered and we won. And I believe one of the reasons that we won is because we proposed to create a public park on the roof of the terminal, about 70 feet up in the air. But this is an area, Rincon, that is being developed very rapidly into families' homes. And some, the best neighborhoods in San Francisco, they have all cohered around a public park, a public square. So this will give them a chance to have a square that otherwise would not exist, because all of the other pieces of land have disappeared. It will, we have just finished design development, working drawings are starting, the project is moving ahead very, very well. This will be one of the facades. That curtain wall is really superfluous. It doesn't enclose anything. It floats away from the building, but it gives shape to the building. Otherwise, if you don't have that, you end up with these very utilitarian, heavy structures, like the the garage port terminal in New York on 8th Avenue, which is such, such an unpleasant thing to have in a, in a city. This will make it a delight to have in the city. It will be, there will be shops on the ground floor. This will be a lovely place to have. And with a very grand space in the very center, this will be the place where most people will enter. Here is where you will buy tickets either to the buses or the trains. And if it's for the buses, you go up two levels. If it's for the trains, you go down two levels. The, and uh, this will be the grand concourse that those columns with the skylights, as we call it the light, light columns, because they will bring natural light from this roof to the second basement, which is where the rapid trains are. So you will have natural light, not much, of course, coming down that far, but you will have natural light at the very bottom of the place. And if you look up, you will be able to see sky, and you will see a ring of trees around each sky light. This is a view from the exterior. This is actually taken from Mission Street and First Street. That's First Street crossing under the terminal, as it does today, actually as it did up until about three months ago. Now the old terminal has been torn down. And this is the, the end of the, of the terminal on Beale Street, about two blocks from Embarcadero. So this is a very key end, and we endeavor to make it as gracious and as light as possible. And you, we, we have designed the park. We are working with pit walkers. So as, a, so as to be visible from the outside, so as to tell people this is a public space. This is not just a terminal, but it is a public space up above. You will know that the park is there. And from the interior, if you are on the second floor, you'll be able to look up and see trees, and you'll be able to look down onto the ground, con ground concourse. And on the, on the roof, there will not only be a park, there will be cafes, places of people to, to, to be around, an amphitheater. It will be a real, real city park. And on the, there are several artists are working, several artists are working on, the, on the project, and we expect that this will be very important just to give it another life. <laughs> this, for example, you can see is a Jenny Holzer a, a, a glass, a glass screen that will have, of course, words running all, all around, and you will see below. You, are, you see the trees in the park that's around, that's around the skylight. In all, we want this building to be telling 
the people of San Francisco, this is your building. This is a, pl a place to be enjoyed, to be used as intensely as you can. And that's one view of the park. So we expect it, it will feel, once you are up there, you will forget that you are on top of a terminal. This will feel like a real city park, like a real wonderful square. There will be fountains, grass, people to sit, places to sit, very welcome for children of all ages. And indeed, we expect children will be here a lot and will be enjoying the place. It's never that warm enough in San Francisco, unfortunately, but some days they will be able to enjoy the fountains. There is actually a saying by Mark Twain that repeated often in San Francisco, says, the coldest winter I have ever experienced was summer in San Francisco. <laughs> and it will be also great at night. It will, it will be full of lights and very welcoming even in the evening. Now, I'll show you a few other projects we have recently finished. This, this as I did with my son Rafael, is it for the University of Illinois, for the School of Business. This will be the Master of Business Administration and Accounting on this building. And we are very proud of it because being an academic building, we have a platinum LEED certification. This is a highly, a highly sustainable building. We, we know that we are going to get at least gold in Transbay, and we are trying very hard to see if we can get platinum also in Transbay. And what you see there, they wanted a, a space where everybody can gather. So we gave them a place where everybody can gather. And it's fantastic space, and people from all other departments of the university keep on wanting to borrow it, as they do if they schedule it properly for their own for their own gatherings. There is, we insisted, and finally the university agreed, there is a cafe just behind me taking the photograph. And, and greatly used mostly by students that come here. They, they love to come and study here, as you see, as, as you see this, this chap right in the corner. And this is also a building that tells people this is a a place of study, you are welcome, you are here well protected. This is a unique moment in your life when you are a student, when everything is being given to you, all of the opportunities are open to you, and here this is a great building for you to be in. Now, this is the, the, the Paul University in Chicago. It's very near downtown in, in, a, in an area called Lincoln Square, very tight, very urban university. And we are work, working on that red part over there, which is the, we are doing a building for the School of Theater, with two theater centers in a very tight urban site and with a maximum allowed height of four stories. So everything needs to be incredibly tightly packed. But we still, we want this building to say something to the students, to the faculty, to the community, so that we have been working very hard on the design. This is on Fullerton Avenue, which is the, the busiest avenue on the, by, by the university. And as you approach it, you will see this is the School of Theater, and you will be able to read the Paul University School of Theater. And there will be a marquee that will tell you what show. This is, there are two theaters. This is the black box, the smaller of the theater, that's why it can be high up. And there is a much larger theater. This is the main lobby on the ground floor. And besides that, there are classrooms, costume shops. It's a very complicated function that the school of theater requires. And that's the, that's the view that crossing Fullerton, this is Racine and this takes you straight to downtown. And that, again, is this, the, the main volume that you see there. This will be limestone on the side, all glass facing north. The building will be, so far, I hope we can keep it, all, all French limestone. Now, we finished recently this event center in Tulsa, 
Oklahoma. It's, they used to be called arenas. But intrigues has seen, something quite wonderful has happened is that other kinds of functions are now more important in terms of the number of events that take place and in terms of the revenues, they are more important than sports. So that now they are called event centers. And this is an event center in, in Tulsa. It will seat 18,000 people. And we, the building also, we wanted it to be exciting, to feel that something special is happening there, to people to be called to go in it and, uh, and design a very attractive, welcoming building, which I believe we have done. So this is the, as you enter, you enter under this very large cantilever. The whole audience could stand up in that porch and wait until the rain abates a little. And, uh, and, and go into the, into the arena. The interior, one of the things we did that I believe makes it a friendlier place. Instead of being forced to take escalators or elevators, we have the elevators and the escalators, but we also have ramps. Very, a, ADA, sorry, a, a, ADA ramps that can take you up and down very gently. You can go up or down on a wheelchair or pushing a, push a stroller, and people do. And, and that is amazing because nobody even asks for the escalators. People prefer to go up and down on the ramp. It's like a promenade. It's a place where you run onto friends and say hello, and you can stop and enjoy the place and just comment in the events to be taking place later on. And this is one of the things that happened there. The circle comes into town, and it's a very popular thing. As you can see, it's packed. It's very difficult to, to get a seat. And, and this probably for, it's 18,000 seats when there is basketball. Probably for the circles, this will be 15, 16,000 people. But that's a lot of people to go and, and sell for a circle show. This is another project in Las Vegas. I have my, my problems with Las Vegas, more theoretically or morally, but we, we need a hotel in, in, in Las Vegas. This is a very large hotel called the Area Hotel, uh, the, which is all of that. Uh, 4,000 4, rooms, and the casino, and the convention center, and the spa, and the theater. All of this together is a very large complex, one of the largest projects we have had in our office in a, in a, in a long, long time. And what was made, us, made this project attractive to us is that our client, which MGM Mirage, did not want kitsch. They did not want this to look like something else. They just wanted a good piece of architecture, an exciting piece of architecture. So this made it exciting for us. And I think that's what we have created. The, the building, in order to accommodate the many rooms, is a long double wave, oops, sorry, that it forms like an S in, in the ground and a double S in the, in, the, in the lower floor so that you can have all of these 4,000 rooms, no room looks at each other, and they all have views. And we are also limited by the height. That's the maximum height we could build because we are not terribly far from the airport. And interestingly, this project was under starting construction when the recession came. And I thought they were going to stop it, but they had long discussions and they continued. And it has opened and everything they tell me is doing very, very well which is very surprising in this, in this climate, in this economic climate. And that's another view of it from the other side, from the, from the main entrance. The, also, we also have a gold lead rating on this hotel, which is not easy to get in a place like Las Vegas. The, the glass is a special glass, and each room has a sunshade. And that's, this, this is the reception desk. And as you can see, 
There is a, you cannot quite read, but there is a Jerry Holzer going on here, and that's a Henry Moore. So, so that is a, if they, have, they have been very good at, at engaging good artists and buying good art, which contributes a great deal to the quality of the experience going there to the architecture. If, it just, if, if there wasn't any gambling, I would feel much happier. <laughs> but I guess gambling is what really pays for the building. They call it gaming, sorry. They, they never use the, the word gambling. It's only gaming. Now, this is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Central Library recent, f finished about a couple of years ago. It was a very dear project of ours. We did it with great en enjoyment. They, it has a, a great roof that creates like a porch on the entrance, an 80-foot high porch. And it also tells people at a distance, here is the library, you know how to come. And this is a way of enticing people that have gone out for a sandwich at noon in the, in the lunch hour, that they could also come to the library and pick up a book at the same time. And they do. It has become a very, very much used library, much more so than they used to. The old library was in the same place. The, the, the walls are treated with ceramic glass that helps reduce glare and reduce sun gain. And the shapes of the ceramic glass are birch trees stretch. They go for four floors. And as you can see, we have real birch trees growing in front of the more abstract birch trees. And this is the interior space. There is a grand avenue-like space that connects both Nicollet Mall with Hennepin Avenue, the two main streets in, in Minneapolis. Those, the post streets take you directly to the, they join at the Mississippi River. They are at an angle. And we are about two blocks away from the Mississippi River. So that this is a place that connects the two avenues and allows people to come from either side. But the secure point in the library is inside. The, this passageway is free. You don't need to be checked or anything. But as if you want to enter the library, you are down below is an entrance check-in. And then you can connect all floors with these bridges. But you are within the controlled area. So this chap that is here studying has entered on that side and come around. We have bridges at both ends. And you can see the large wedge of aluminum that keeps on going out that goes at both ends. That holds, feels like if it was suspended in midair. And the main thing indeed is books. And, and the stacks are open and very available. And all, people of all ages, particularly children, love to go there and look for them and find their own books. We also have, at their request, a very large children library within the main library. Uh, and it's on the ground floor so that the kids can go directly into the, into the children library. And is, as you can see, it's scale for children, it's colorful, it's pleasant. There are books available of all kinds. There are moments when there are storytelling hours. There are games. It's a very attractive place for children. A very, very popular place to go in Minneapolis. And another corner, or the same. It's a very large children library. And we also have a teen space space. And that, at the request of the librarian, is as far away from the children as we could place it. So this is at the other end of the building, on the second floor. The children is on the ground floor. And this is especially for teens. Now, this is an interesting project just to show you. This is a very old project. I, I designed this building uh, starting in 1971. It was finished around 1974. It's the Pacific Design Center in what was then Los Angeles County. Now it is the city of West Hollywood. And they nicknamed the Blue Whale, 
which I, I love the name. And I love when buildings get nicknames. It means that they resonate in, in people that live there. And that's how you saw it from the street. And that view still remains unchanged. But since then, in the mid-80s, we were asked to add a, a green building, which is more extension of more showrooms. Since then, the whole showroom business has collapsed. The, the, most of the, of the industries making furniture, they have consolidated, and there are much fewer companies making furniture than they used to be, so they don't need as many showrooms. They need fewer showrooms than they used to. So that, that green building was transformed into offices of functions related to, to, to furniture and, 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 and interiors, but not with furniture. And now recently, we already at the beginning planned to have a blue, a green, and a red building but only the blue and the green were built. Now, this is what is very interesting is, see, that is West Hollywood. And this is the, this plaza here is the heart of West Hollywood. This is actually what allowed the people in this area of Los Angeles County to get together, to organize, and to incorporate this city, the city of West Hollywood. The, the, and we were hoping now that the red building to take place be in more showrooms as I showed earlier. But now it's going ahead, and you can see it there, but it is going ahead as offices. So that those are two small offices sitting on a plinth of parking, all covered in bright red glass. See, that's the glass being installed, the building is almost finished, the glass, and the glass is bright, bright red, as, as red as you can imagine, and it's, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And very soon, it will look like that. It will be quite spectacular, both the, the red, the green, and the blue buildings. Now, what is, for me, particularly interesting, this is very personal, this will be finished in 2011 which means that this would have taken 40 years of my life to see this, from this project from beginning to end. Sometimes I think, well, perhaps this is a gift because it forces me to stay alive to see the whole building finished. <laughs> now, this is in Hartford, Connecticut. What you see there is the Connecticut River. The photo has been taken from East Hartford across the Connecticut River onto the city of Hartford. And we were asked, actually, this was also, most of the projects have been shown are competitions that we won. This was also an international competition. This is a museum of science, or called the Connecticut Science Center. And what you see there is a very simple scheme. The, in the center, there's this very tall space, we call it Science Alley, it's about six stories high, with exhibit spaces on both sides, with bridges connected across. And it's a very colorful thing. The, the main highway, I-91, runs here, and so that's the train. So you see it every time you go to Hartford or past Hartford, and I do that all the time because to go to the Hartford Airport, I got to go from New Haven past, past Hartford. And it's very visible, and this roof, we call it the flying wing, projects quite a bit, and it catches your eye before anything else. See, that's the, the flying wing. It used to be much taller, much longer, but this building has suffered many bouts of so-called value engineering. Which, so, which means cost cutting. Uh, but the, the essence of the building has survived, so I, I'm not complaining. And this is the city side of, of the building, also very colorful, very attractive. Looks like that. The, the screen at the left is extremely low resolution LEDs, but enough as to have simple images change and move and catch your eye. 
and, and what this was intended is primarily to catch the eye of adolescents. That is, because this is really an educational facility. This is the intention, the reason to build the science center was to get teenagers involved in science and interested in science, you know, and the principles of science, and perhaps to make them think that they should follow a scientific career. So the, the first thing you need to do is, is to catch their attention, to bring them in. And this is, I believe, catches their attention. Uh, and that's the interior space of Science Alley, and it gets all, it, amazingly full of people, as you can see. It's really crowded with people. It's wonderful, very popular. Has, it has been open about a year and it's incredibly popular. And kids love it. And we thought it would be primarily full of teenagers, but this is full of children of all ages. Even little children just love being there. Actually, most of them just like hanging around. You can just see in, in, the, in the exhibit, very, very popular museum. Now, this is a hospital in Doha, in Qatar, uh, under, under construction. It is a very large general hospital, which is research and teaching hospital. And originally, our mandate was to design three independent wings with common central facilities, but three completely independent wings. One for children, one for women, one for men. But recently, I was in Qatar about 10 days ago, and our, our client is the, the Sheikha Musa, and she directed us that she has decided that this will be no men in this hospital, only women and children. So this is a gigantic women and children hospital. This is about a million and a half square feet plan to grow to about three million square feet. The, this is a clinic building that will double up in size, form in the semicircle around a very old home that was built there and is being kept. And there is a cemetery that is also being saved here. So each one of these halls is the center space of one of the wings. And that's how it will look when you approach it. This sun-shaded elements that are meant to remind you of sails in the Persian Gulf are, are indeed sunshades as you approach the building. There's no need to protect you from the rain, but yes, from the sun. And the building is very well protected from the, from the sun. This, this looks almost north, and still we have this pixelation of solid elements and, and glass are with a different color in each one of the wings. As you enter, you have a very large space under each one of the wings. This, the, the, these are LED images, sorry. These are LED images so that the images will be changing continuously. And those are high definition LED images. And you are, this is all just entrances and these are common functions. The, the, the hospital starts really at that level, and you can see trees there. They call that the wellness floor. That is the concourse as you enter at the ground level. This is where all of the three wings are connected. And this is up above one of the patient's floors in the wellness level. This is obviously uh, one of the areas for women and children. Women and children can mix, men, men cannot. And there it is, well under construction, should open in, in, in mid-2012. Uh, and we are really looking, looking forward to it. Most of the heavy work has been done. This photograph is about two months old. When, when I was there, they, they, this was completely clad, and they were already starting to build the, the elements within in, in the roof. And 
when finished, it will look like this. I think it will be a spectacular shape. These are, these are extremely tall forms that will be seen from very, very far away. Particularly in the desert, it will be seen from very far away. This is in Education City in Doha, where Qatar is entered into associations with several American universities to have a, a number of different functions. The hospital will actually be run by Cornell Medicine, but they also have other, other buildings where they are in working in associations with Carnegie Mellon and Texas A&M. In Philadelphia, we are doing a new hospital for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP. And, and again, what we wanted is how to make a hospital as pleasant and attractive to children. So this is a very loose set of forms, again, like what a child may make, within many constraints, of course. Uh, that's another view of it. And that's how you will see it as you approach it on the street. And as you can see, each floor has a, a different color that you see there. And this is the image that will be retained by a child that is being brought to this hospital. That's what they will remember. So it is a building that is meant to speak to children. To, and our audience, our, our customers really, are the children that will be coming to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is or should start, should start construction in mid-2011. In mid and in Galveston, Texas, these are Moody Gardens. Moody Gardens are a very popular attraction of people, a bit like Knott's Berry Farm near Disneyland, or a bit like Disneyland itself, which is owned by the Moody family of Houston. This is very, very, very near Houston. And on the on the Gulf, and they already have two large pyramids. One is with flora and fauna of tropical zone, another one of temperate zone, and they have asked us to build a habitat for Arctic life, so that people can go and enjoy that. They already have a hotel, a convention center many restaurants, it's a very, very popular attraction because this is less than an hour away from Houston. And that's how the domes will look like that contain this space. This is highly sustainable. We've been working with our sustainability consultants and this will be a highly sustainable building. Although the, the, the idea may be a bit questionable is why build an Arctic in southern Texas. But beyond that, I think we, we are doing a, a great job. And it's going to be indeed delightful to go there and see polar bears and ice in, in, in near Houston. The, and you will also, children will be able to get very close to Arctic marine animals. And so that this should be a very attractive element thing to have in, in southern Texas, on the, on the Gulf of Mexico. But the most in interesting project we have, really, is the National Children's Museum, which I think will be fantastic. I hope, at least to children, that this will really sing loudly. The, we have designed this very much with children in mind, trying I made many efforts, and any of you try, it's not so easy. Try to remember what it was being seven years old. And boy, you think it's going to be easy. It's very difficult. It takes a huge effort to start collecting bits and pieces of memories, putting them all together until you can relive those years when you were seven years old that you felt so fragile, so vulnerable, at the same time so full of life Life is so exciting, and this is what we are designing for. And, and with that kind of spirit, this pylon in, in this is a 200-foot-high element with a wind turbine that will produce substantial amount of electricity. The museum will have a living wall, a green wall, actually 
really living, like a vertical garden, and very colorful set of forms that should appeal to children. The museum site is in National Harbor. The, the District of Columbia ends about here. So this is about 500 feet from the south of the District of Columbia, almost diagonally across from Alexandria, Virginia. And this is the site for the museum, two and a half blocks from the harbor and from the marina. This is, if you drive from DC, this is the first thing you will see. You are just leaving the District of Columbia here, and this is what you will see. That's why that pylon was so important. It will immediately catch your eye and tell you, here we are, this is where the fun begins. That's how it, is. it sits in National Harbor. It's a very popular marina. And it will be a great place to come with your kids in a boat. And this is how the museum will see from the marina itself. Very visible, very attractive. This, all of this is important because a building like a children's museum cannot be just like an institution, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is something else. This has to engage children. Children need to want to go there. They should not be dragged into the museum because if you drag them into the museum, then all the point is lost. They, they need to want to be there. And it, will, it will be on two main streets, particularly American Way that takes you to the harbor, 200 blocks away, and also St. George Boulevard. Actually, if you come from DC, most likely you will drive down St. George Boulevard. The building will be built in two stages. At the right is the final stage, and at the left is the first stage that should start construction August next year. The, and should, should, op, should open in 2013. The main elements will be there in the first stage. There are three permanent galleries that will be there in the first stage. They will become larger in the second stage, and in the second stage also there will be a temporary gallery for changing exhibits. And there will be elements like a, like a cafe or a gift shop that will not be part of the first stage, nor administration. That's actually a very large part of the building that is being postponed. Administration, cafe, gift shop will, will be built on the second stage. Both will have a garden, so that the garden will, that will eventually be here is a permanent piece of the museum. And the outdoor garden contained by all of the other exhibits and being seen by everyone in the museum is a very important component. This is where the children are in direct contact with nature, where they can, there will be areas where they'll be allowed to dig holes in the ground or plant trees or other plants. This, the, the experience of interchanging with nature is very important in the, in the pedagogical purpose of, of the museum, because this museum is truly an educational institution. This is, the kids are being formed here, are being told about themselves, about their place in the world, about their responsibilities to the world. They are being told about their place in America, what being an American means, and also they are being told about how to live in a world now with people of many different races, many different religions, and, and many different languages. And all of this is part of the purposes of the Children Museum. The second floor, same as you can see, similar type of galleries, only smaller in the first place, and no, no administration. And the third floor, and the fourth, fourth floor or roof, which is primarily administration. Now, those are sections just cut through, the, which gives you an idea of the proportion of the courtyards in, in both cases, both fairly general spaces, well, very well proportioned courtyards. 
same sections on the other direction. And view, this is a view from St. George, St. George Boulevard. Very colorful elements, very much like what a child may have wanted to design himself or herself, with very different materials. The, the orange element will be porcelain enamel metal, the blue will be glazed brick. So that they will have not only different colors, but different tactile feelings. And the, the, the yellow pylon will be, as I said, very noticeable. You cannot quite read, but there is a wind turbine in this place. And this is the view on American way. And this is the green wall. This will be a living wall. We are providing a, a, a wild armature with plants living all top to bottom. And all, all of the roofs will be green roofs so that they will be very sustainable. They contribute to capture storm, storm water and they contribute to mitigate the effects of summer or winter in the floors below. That's how it will look on the corner, a collection like a, things that a child could have built, but with elements that they will feel comfortable with, that they can understand. These are not something that things that adults make for themselves and that they bring children in. This is designed and built for children. And it will be a very clear view. This is the corner of George Street and American Way. And the entry piece. This will be an LED screen that will be changing continuously and catching your eye. And there will be a number of events taking place just as soon as you enter the building with a great skylight. That's what you will see if you drive up American Way. You can see very clearly the, the green wall on this corner. Another view of the green wall. Same similar view on, on a model. And this is the first phase, which will be half of the building, but will be complete in all of the elements a child may be interested in. It will be fun, it will be exciting, and it will be real. So I cannot wait until this is built in, the, in 2013 and we can all go there with our grandchildren or children to celebrate. For me, my grandchildren, my granddaughters. <laughs> they, they, I know they will love this. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caesar. Joining us on stage now, of course, is Kathy Dwyer Southern, who is the president and CEO of the National Children's Museum. It's no coincidence that we ended on that project. <laughs> uh, Kathy has been uh, with the, the National Children's Museum since it was in its previous incarnation as the Capitol Children's Museum. Some of you may remember it from uh, a site over here uh, near Capitol Hill. And in that position, she oversaw the organization's exhibitions, programs, all of the activities, uh, as well as the, the closing and now the relaunch of the museum in this new format. She previously served as president and CEO of Port Discovery, another children's museum in, in Baltimore, and was formerly the executive director of James Madison's Montpelier, as well as the director of the National, National Cultural Alliance. She is currently on the board, she's the vice chair, in fact, of Partners for Livable Communities, and her other professional affiliations include, have included serving on the board of directors of the American Association of Museums, as well as the uh, American Association of Museums International Council of Museums, and the Association of Children's Museums, appropriately enough. Uh, she was also the recipient of the Distinguished Business Alumni Award from the School of Business at the University of Wisconsin in 2000. So, uh, they're joining me here for a conversation, which will take uh, uh, this a little bit further to find out about the plans for the National Children's Museum. 
Uh, to begin with, uh, Kathy, I'd like to uh, ask you if you could tell us a bit about the, uh, how you came to choose Pelly Clark Pelly uh, for this project, among all of the other architects out there. After we uh, were designated as the National Children's Museum by the Congress here, uh, the United States Congress, we began looking for a new site. For many of you, you remember our site uh, behind Union Station. Thank you, Mark, for reminding of this. It's a site that we uh, was loved to death in a building that was loved to death. Um, <laughs> and it was really time to find a location that made a lot of sense for us. Where we settled was with, uh, at Lafont Plaza with a plan that JBG had for the redevelopment of Lafont Plaza. And together, JBG and the National Children's Museum invited five architectural firms uh, to propose their designs for a mixed-use development in Lafont Plaza. Um, it was not very hard to decide. They were all internationally recognized firms, but Caesar and uh, the Pelly firm were clearly our choice from the beginning. And I think that, w that was so much true for both of us, especially for us, because of how much, uh, Caesar, you and your firm think about the values that the institution stands for. And as a children's museum, that, of course, is supreme for us. So it was a joint decision, uh, and, um, and we began work there. Uh, and we have a model for any of you who want to see that's back at the office for the museum that would have been at Lafont Plaza. But after uh, how long, Caesar? A year and a half, I think, of work. About a year and a half, yeah. Uh, we, we had a fully, fully developed scheme, which was quite wonderful in itself. A different, Be very different from this. A different scheme. And we were part of the mixed-use development, so one of the things that uh, uh, I think we both agreed about was not as, mu as much as we had hoped for for the museum, other than a beautiful entrance uh, area that Caesar had designed that was really a kind of bird's nest, really quite beautiful. Um, the museum itself was underground because of being part of the mixed-use development. As it came to pass, JBG uh, got a hold of us and said, our timing is changing. We're afraid the timetable won't work for you at, uh, uh, at uh, Lafont Plaza. And that led us to then look again. Martin, uh, it took almost a year. Uh, in terms of looking at other sites, we ended up with the decision to be able to go to a f Greenfield site uh, at National Harbor. And I must say, again, fortunate enough for the Pelly firm to have stayed with us through that period of time, through the search for a new site, and then to have agreed with us that this was a, a, a perfect yeah. solution and, and, for and us. I, and, I, and I believe that the National Harbor sites and location really is a, it's a huge improvement. It's a pity not to be within the District of Columbia, but the museum was constrained, parking was very limited, not easy to get to unless you walk several blocks. Here, this will be extremely easy to go to, much friendlier, and it will feel childlike from the beginning. O over there, much of the museum was in a below grade expanse, which were going to be, for the children, was going to be like being nowhere. This will be somewhere at every moment. There are windows everywhere, so you will know where you are. You will be able to see what your friends are doing on the garden. And, uh, and I think this is a much more real feeling place than Longfarm Plaza was. One of the things that the museum and, and your firm have talked about is the idea of architecture as an educational tool in and of itself. Could you, Caesar, elaborate on that? Uh, you talked a, a bit about some of the, uh, uh, the design elements of this project, but how are you really envisioning using the architecture as a teaching tool? Well, this, this is indeed part of a basic purpose. And now, we architects are trained to adjust to innumerable different purposes that buildings may be built to. And education is one of the, the noblest ones that you can think of. The, and it's something that has always interested me all my life. I've been a teacher most of my life. And I love teaching. And I have great respect for those that can teach and communicate. And here, what we are asking the building to do is to almost teach by itself and to provide the tools for docents to go much further in, in what they are inculcating to the children. This should be a great uplifting 
experience for children, a way to grow, to mature. One of the things that, that struck me about the, the museum is its very clear and direct mission statement, which is simply to inspire children to care about and improve the world. And as, as Caesar talked about the, the green aspects of this and knowing that the museum is, is making a, a, an effort to tie sustainability directly to these educational uh, uh, aspects of the, of the mission, uh, how much of that has developed recently or to what extent has sustainability always been an element of, of the museum's programming? And how, is that, uh, how are the two things working together? How is the building's green design influencing the mission of the museum and vice versa? It's been part, at least for me, Caesar. I know you can we'll speak to this as well, but one of the um, great strength of this collaboration is that, is that those, the elements of the built uh, environment and the mission and institution, which we are in the business of now creating a new national institution, that these two things came together. We certainly had the vision for the museum as um, being the nation's children's museum. But I'll, I'll tell you, Martin, that, that 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 mission statement really evolved during the period of when when we had moved to to National Harbor, and the two the two elements, the built part of the building and, and our goals institutionally have developed together. I think the best buildings, and I love your analogy of singing, we, as I said to Martin as we were looking at this building, I'm no longer objective about this building. I just simply love it. Um, and I know that's not how you're supposed to be as a client, but I've gone over to the dark side and I just love the building. I think it sings. And part of the reason it sings is because we are about sustainability. We are about in, in inspiring children inspiring children, it's what museums do, especially children's museums, to care about, that comes from our exhibits and experiences within the museum, to care about and improve the world. So there's a call to action here as well, Martin, and, and, and the sustainability piece reads so well, um, as you've just said, as a teaching tool. Yeah. Well, you know, much of what makes a building sustainable is invisible to lay people. It has to do more with how do your windows seal with how, what controls you have on the lights, how the, how, what controls you have in your mechanical systems, etc. That's where the building becomes truly sustainable. But because we are doing all of those things, but beyond that, what is important is that it also be visibly sustainable. We have this wind turbine that will be part of the main element in the building, and we have the green wall and the green roofs. Those will be very visible and very noticeable, and they will tell people this is a sustainable building. Although they will contribute a rather small percentage of what you need to be a gold lead rated building. It is one of the benefits, um, as we see, and so much of your work, Caesar, is now uh, looking at lead issues, that if you're a, an office building, a, an events center, those are with missions that are not event center perhaps, but they're not educational institutions. So one of the great opportunities we have here is to use the whole building with ideas around sustainability that are operational as well as the built environment that you can take home. So the issues of rain barrels, for instance, I don't know if we'll have a rain barrel. We'll have a rain barrel outside. Oh yes, absolutely. That's right. So there are things that, that we know, all of us, this room is filled with people who care about these yes, kinds you know, of issues. So, so probably one, some of the things that will contribute most is that we are going to use very large percentages of fly ash in our concrete and concrete blocks. Fly ash is a byproduct of coal, of, of coal manufacturing, so, and, but this reduces great amounts of use of, of cement that, is, that requires much energy to be produced and makes the concrete much stronger. So that you, you, you need to use less of it. So, and we will do the same with steel. All the steel will be recycled. And, and we even plan to use recycled bricks as much as we can. So all of those things count for a lot. And there may be on a story that is available to children, but it's not so visible. That's why the green wall will be extremely visible. Even if you don't go into the museum, you should just go by an American way. That will catch your eye. One of the other interesting things about this museum, and maybe it's easy to make too much of this, but it strikes me that uh, most museums are museums of something. Uh, that is, that they're identified primarily by their subject matter, whether it's a museum of art, a museum of building. But children's museums are identified primarily by their audience, as children. 
And uh, it, it, Caesar, you've certainly designed, as we've seen, quite a few, a wide variety of projects, including a lot of museums. How does that focus on the audience rather than the subject matter inform your design process? Well, you, you need to, it, the, what this, the museum is a vessel for another purpose. And what we need to be able to do is to accommodate the needs of the teaching and exhibit as closely as possible. We, we've been working very closely with three firms of exhibit design. Uh, w w w w one, one is called Roto Studios, they are in, in Columbus, Ohio. Another one is called Amazing Design, and they are in, in Boston. The third one is Arnold Pair, and they are in Vancouver. Each one of them is doing one floor, so that the quality of the exhibits will change by this, not only by the material, but by the sensitivity of the three different designers. So, that, so it will be a much richer experience than if a single exhibit designer did all three floors. And we have been working very closely with them. They have been very supportive of what we have done. Two, two points to add to that, Martin. One, one is, I. Um, I totally agree with you. Uh, the title National Children's Museum really says uh, who we are, uh, and children is our middle name. So we are here for children. Unlike some of our um, colleagues in the field, however, we are about content, uh, and we are about content in six areas where, where we're quite similar to, for instance, science centers that are focused on a specific subject area. So the environment, for instance, is one of our core areas. Civic engagement is another, is another core area and, and most appropriate for us being here in Washington. Play at the center of, uh, we say, obviously, the work of children is, is play, the arts, part of who we are. And then, as Martin has, uh, uh, as Caesar has mentioned earlier, um, world cultures, because for us, the museum is the trip from uh, me, where small children, health and well-being is our beginning point, where children, small children start out. When you're two, you're focused on who you are, standing up, eating well, um, and developing the whole child. But the rest of life is about our we-ness, some people never advance from meanness. <laughs> Get stuck there. But we believe in weeness. And the ultimate weeness for us is the citizen of the world. So for us, that content is layered throughout, throughout the museum. So we're about both the child, I mean the visitor, children, and these major content areas. The other place that we've kept our childness alive, Caesar's able to project back to being seven. I've seen you do this. You really can get a hold of the child uh, in you. We have also turned to children uh, throughout the area. We've had a regional committee and are developing a national committee. And they are gosh darn hard about what they think should work in a children's museum. So they're very clear about the architecture. It's the only time Mr. Pelly has had a review panel of nine-year-olds <laughs> review his work. He's doing very well so far, but we keep him on his toes here. Um, and, and, and in fact, in many ways, we've shared this, when they have taken a look at the model, they read the model more easily and with more understanding than s some of my staff and board members have. So there's, a, there's an intuitive sense about what, what this means. So children have helped us define who we are as well. Let's talk a bit more about that, that process, because I know you've also launched the launch, jo launch Zone, as you call it, which, as I understand it, is both a web-based component but also a physical site uh, that's kind of in preparation for the ultimate museum, but also as a means of gathering ideas and information. Uh, to what extent have the architects been involved in that, and what has, how has that changed your conception, either your conception or your conception, of what the museum will ultimately be? We, we, we work really very much under the guidance of, of Kathy. We, we really depend on her to translate whatever needs appear for, for us to, to reinterpret. But we are very sensitive to the needs of the museum and to all of the peculiarities of the museum, and we design to them. So the launch zone for us has been a place where we have a place at National Harbor it's a total of 2,700 square feet. So, Martin, it's half the space. Uh, you know, it's quite small. Uh, it's a storefront. Uh, and um, in the 14 months it's been there, we've had 40,000 children and families through the space. S speaking to the need, which people say to me every day, is when are you going to open? Open that museum. We need you. Um, 
and it has been the place where we're prototyping exhibits, so a number of our exhibit, uh, our exhibit concepts are being tried out there. Sustainability has been a core issue for us there, a notion of how, how kids can get involved. That's where the rain barrel has been. We, we in many ways are alive and well as a children's museum today. We serve 200,000 kids and families in the region, here in the district, in Maryland and Virginia, as we always did when we were at Union Station. Through our programs throughout the region, um, like tonight, but in addition to uh, the Marine Corps Marathon, et cetera. Um, so we're very much on the ground programmatically, but the launch space has given us a physical space where we can try out these ideas and where kids, again, we're continually polling uh, and, and hearing from them what they think is important and working. It has created a very vital setting for us to continue to stay very close to our audience as we're developing the institution. The web is another component, and um, Caesar, you've really helped us think about that as well. We're not driven by technology. We, I think we share this value in the sense that it isn't technology for technology's sake, but rather technology can be extraordinarily important. And for us to communicate as the nation's children's museum, with the 48 million children under the age of 12 across the country, even I, as the president, do not believe all 48 million of them will come to visit us here at National Harbor. I, I, have, I have strong beliefs in this museum. They won't all get here. So through our national programs, we're working in over 15 states now across the country, our, our national partnerships, many of them uh, with us across the country, and then finally the website. It's a way of involving kids, and the web in particular We've talked a lot about this, of where you can start the visit before you come to the museum, enjoy your visit at the museum, interacting, making your journal, having your favorite areas, becoming involved, for instance, in the environment, and then going home and coming back to us through the web on what you're doing, what kinds of things are really exciting to you. And then we'll share that, that the wonderful entry area, Caesar, those big pictures there are heroes of the minute because kids are really making a lot of difference in this world today, and we want to lift up that, that difference that they're making. As, as, as you can see, she's a great client, very clear-headed, and, and able, <laughs> able to express her, her ideas and feelings very clearly. I, well, I think every architect will tell you that great projects require great clients. As you've gone through the, this process so far, though, have there been any points of conflict, either in terms of, of concept or vision or process, uh, it seems like those are inevitable. How do you resolve them? How have you resolved them so far? We, we, we have had, I don't think we have ever had any, any real conflict. I think it's, we have been of one mind almost from the beginning. I, where I tend to want to resolve issues with Caesar is a hug and a kiss. Now, I know that isn't exactly the way you're supposed to do business, but I find it a, oh, yeah. a wonderful way no, we, to we, we, we like to, we listen. We are very good listeners in our firm. And we expect and we want our clients to, to, to tell us what this is that they want, that they need. We, I want every building that I design for, for my client to also to be able to say, this is my design. I, I, that will make me happy. So that I want them to be true collaborators. So that in, in, in that, with that spirit is that, you know, Kathy has been a great collaborator. That, that setting makes it easy to resolve differences. There's just no doubt about that. We have all had experiences. It doesn't have to be client-architect relationship where one party is not listening or willing to listen. And Caesar, you've really created an environment for us that allows us as the client to be willing to speak our minds and to back, back down, change our minds as we, as we grow together. I think two testing points for us was, for me at least, when we moved to National Harbor, that could have been a point in time. This is not a firm looking for business. Um, so you could have decided not to go with us. Enough, enough. Here we are on yet another location. And that right. you, you didn't. I, I respect oh, it yeah, so absolutely. much. Absolutely. No, no, this was, we had long discussion. It was very clear. We understood from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the other one is uh, we've just spent, and this is probably a good example, we've just spent two days ve -ing. Now, if you want to test the architect-client relationship, it is to see how they are with each other after two days of doing value engineering. And we still seem to be liking each other. <laughs> so <laughs> I think those are things we've been able to work our way through. Well, I know you said you can't be objective anymore, but as you look at the project now, as much as you like it, 
how, how similar or different is it to compared to where you started? What did, what did you have a sense of what this might be, and how has that changed over time? It's very different from where we started, isn't it, Caesar? Oh, to, to, to from where we started, Lanfran Plaza, totally different. No, no, no comparison, and much better. So in, in some ways, the, 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 the loss of the space in Anfan Plaza was very fortunate, because this is a much better building. I think it's going to be more interesting to children, more fun to go there. It's more, in my mind, it's more joyous. It really has an energy and vitality to it that, that is very exciting. And we have, certainly have, there have been moments as the architecture, I think there was a moment in time where the orange building wasn't tilted and then the next time we came in, it had tilted. Ah, and, ah, and, and we all said, my gosh, it, ah, it ah, fell ah, over. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and, and for us, each of these pieces have really inspired us and we could feel yeah. the, the vitality and intelligence and the creativity of the Pelly firm with us, so it is, I totally agree with you, I think it's gotten so much more Abs exciting. Abs absolutely. Yeah. The, um, I know, you, of course, with your experience, not only with Port Discovery, but also through other associations, you have a, a good sense of what other children's museums and other museums in general are doing. Uh, what sort of lessons have you learned, both positive and negative, that, have, that you've applied now in this project? Especially, you, you really got Port Discovery out of the ground. And uh, what are you doing differently now based on your experience? Well, I, th I think first and foremost, the notion of, uh, and Caesar, you, you flatter me by saying I'm, I'm clear. I certainly have had whole portions of my life when I've been less clear. So um, I think my experience in working in museums has been to find the mission, to really understand what you stand for, and then be able to go forward with the institution. Uh, in other instances, we sometimes have had I've been in settings where that's been clamped on. I've had a mission once where it was, actually the mission for CCM initially was a paragraph long and even I couldn't say it as the director. So having everything uh, evolve and, and, and uh, come out from uh, the mission has been really critical to us and that I've learned that over time and there are colleagues uh, in the museum world overall where that's true and not true. We all learn from each other. The more you keep honing on that I think is, an, is, is extraordinarily important. The other area that we've spent time on and will keep evolving now um, is the whole issue of accessibility. For us as a children's museum it, it is absolutely essential that every child who knows of us, feels welcome, and sees themselves in the museum. If they don't, we have not done our job. It's a different matter for adults. Adults can choose to pick where they want to go, but if a child wants to come, they have to be, they have to see it as their place. And I mean that in terms of universal design in the widest sense. And again, Cesar, this is something you helped us so much with as we've thought about it. You think about the built environment, of course, and the whole issue of ADA and those, that, that whole set of activities, but what about autism? What about some of the social sides of this? And then, of course, what about the many cultures that we serve here in Washington um, and, and worldwide? You may not live here, but if you're, if you're a family in Qatar and, and know of Pelly and come here, we want you to feel welcome. So that issue of, accessi of accessibility, how many languages should be in the museum, mm -hmm. those are issues that we very are very much before us today. And you have set a standard yeah. for us with the built environment. To sure. Also very important is that this is not the Washington Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. This is the National Children's Museum. So it is not in competition with other children's museum. It's somehow the umbrella uh, the one that will represent the interest of all children museum in this country. It's, it's in a very special situation. And then last, I remember this very well with Port Discovery and anyone in the audience who's either uh, uh, been the architect for a museum or worked in one and you do a new wing or especially if you do a new institution. I remember uh, us opening Port Discovery in Baltimore with great lines and it was absolutely thrilling and you know that those last few moments of where you're jamming flowers into pots and the paint's still wet as you open the doors and all the things that happen around opening and then about a month later a, a family who had come four or five times came up to me and said this is great what's new and I wanted to strangle them. <laughs> How could that question have been asked? So, of course, opening the museum is just the beginning. Um, and the notion of newness, of continuing to reveal who we are, it's one of the gifts, quite frankly, of phasing the museum, which we did out of 
uh, we felt it was a prudent move to be able to keep the project moving in the times that we are all living in. But it gives us a second bump, quite frankly, to the museum. 2013 opening, a second opening in 2015. So that notion that opening isn't the end, it's the beginning, and how to stay fresh and, uh, and inviting is, a, is, a, is a, something I've learned from my colleagues in previous experience. I'm very appreciative, uh, Mr. Pelle, of you being here tonight and seeing your beautiful design. Um, I'm curious as to the total age range of children. I guess you mean like baby toddlers <laughs> until up to 17 years old, or, you know. We, I'm kind of curious about teenage use of it as well. A great question. And we do know, and you all know uh, with your children, that teenagers don't want little kids around them. So we go up to, or some teenagers, um, our focus is, is from the youngest. Uh, and there, there's an early learner's gallery specifically for, for one and two year olds. Up to about 11, 12 is our, is our focus in that whole age range. Because guess what? Families come as family units, so you don't have four four-year-olds. Some folks do, but not <laughs> right. so often. Um, you've got a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. So it's a family experience. Um, some exhibits focus more at the upper end. So for instance, civic engagement really deals with a town, your town environment, but then also uh, the Oval Office. We'll have an Oval Office, the Supreme Court. You get to be a member of the Supreme Court. I know a number of you out here probably will want to be a member of the Supreme Court. I wouldn't mind being a member of the Supreme Court. So trying that out in terms of what it means to solve a case, and of course, Capitol Hill and the legislature. That will not appeal to two-year-olds, and that will appear to nine-year-olds. So we look at that age span throughout the museum. Other questions? We've covered everything. Oh, wait, just one over here. So, so I'm just asking about uh, your un new University of Iowa auditorium that replaces the one that was damaged in the flood. I was asking what stage uh, you are in the design of that. Yeah, yes, we, we have been selected to, to design a new Hancher Theater for the University of Iowa to replace the very famous old Hancher Theater had been designed by Max Abramovich around 1971, but that it was destroyed by the very large flood of the Iowa River. So that we'll be designing a new Hancher Theater in higher ground. And it's a very exciting project, Wonder, wonderful people. And the Hancher has a, is a very famous theater with a great history and of, of major performers having got there. And the timing on it, Cesar, what's the, the... We, we have just started the design. We have barely started having the, had a, just one meeting with the, with the university and the faculty. So probably this will start construction, I'm guessing, around mid-2012, mid and theaters are slow to build, so that will take a couple of years. So that, it will probably be finished in 2014. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, right here. Oh, oh, sorry. Got, he got to there first. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you. Uh, I know in my family I'm surrounded. I've got a, a young son who's an architect and a daughter who works for an architecture, graduate architecture school. And on the other side, my wife's a kindergarten teacher. So you've got both topics. <laughs> but two things struck me. One is when I think of museum, I, I think of history and heritage and sort of backward looking, even, even if it's proactive. I'm wondering if the name Children's Museum, the word museum is kind of wrong and we need a new word because I think of it as current activities and forward looking stuff. And we have progressed to the point, I think, where we talk about greenness to children. I know that's a big thing with my wife's kindergarten class these mm -hmm. days and it's the state requirements. But what about other things that we might put in children's museums like uh, about health care, because that's a big issue now in the United States about children being too obese. How do we integrate that kind of activity into a facility of this kind? It's a very good question, and uh, the, the issue of the word museum, we have, I've been there for nine years, I think we debate it oh, every other day. Uh, you know, is it, is it the right word or not? And um, we, 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 we still are using it, because in fact we are a collection of exhibits uh, we don't have a collection per se. Well, we, we have a collection of, of, um, of uh, work um, 
that is a very small part of, of who we are. So we think museum as it is defined today, and I did spend a number of years on the board of the American Association of Museums, science centers, uh, uh, botanical gardens, zoos and aquaria are all considered museums. Um, so the word, the word can mean more than a historical look, a, a look backwards, but rather really an interactive uh, uh, place and children's museums, as Caesar has mentioned, there are almost 300 of them around the country. It's a brand, brand, and I mean that word for many families. You know this as as well that you say, oh, a children's museum. I know that's that's for me and my kids. We may how we're trying to s solve that issue of that we're forward looking and interactive is probably some sort of tagline along with the National Children's Museum. You know, it's. Caesar Pelli's favorite place. No, uh, we'll come up with something that really tells you, tells you, tells you what it else, what it is. Um, around the issue of health, I, I sort of skipped over that, but health and well-being is the first major exhibit in the museum, um, and that's because that's where you start. That's where your wife knows very well, and and you as well as a kindergarten teacher, with, where you start as a child. So, the physicality of that. Um, one exhibit I'll, I'll just uh, touch on is a 40-foot long girl, and you'll be able to enter her as a piece of apple, and then you can figure out what happens to you inside and what the experience is to be an apple. So we, we, um, we think that, that kids really want to know how they work. They want to know how it, what's going on inside. They also want to be in a place that's safe. Um, uh, the special needs kids that I was mentioning, the issue of autism, for instance, which is uh, something we're really exploring with Children's National Medical Center uh, and others is something that's very important to us to create safe environments and quiet, more quiet environments. So the whole child is at the center of us as a starting point, uh, and health and well-being is a beginning place for us. We had to make the decision, however, that we can't be all things to all people, because then you end up being you know, an inch wide and a mile, or an, an inch deep and a mile wide. So we have these six areas where we're do be, doing a deeper dive and where we want to stay up on uh, content in really a very deep way. So Children's National Medical Center, for instance, and NIH are our partners in the health and well-being area. We need to be providing you as parents current information in what's happening in each of these areas. And for our kids, they need to have current information, not something that was true 10 or 15 years ago. We struggle with the name issue every day. So. Well, with that, I know there are a few other questions out there, but we've reached the end of our time. So I would like to thank both of our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for coming.